till then, I'd, I'd like to present um, Lynn and Frank Zetzman um, to give us a little talk about what they do as artists. So we should begin, right? You should begin. <laughs> okay. uh, well, I am, as you said, uh, I'm a sculptor, uh, predominantly working in ceramics and, uh, and a drawer. And I draw in all the mediums, pretty much pastel, conte, ink, charcoal, uh, and maybe the most consistent thing that I do is draw. I, I draw all a lot and uh, and really it sort of dictates where I go in my pieces. Uh, my work changes quite a bit. Uh, it does tend to be representational of a sort uh, based on natural objects or the figure and I uh, I, I generally work in with a series of objects, uh, and then when the cat when the series starts to run its course for me, or I run out of gas with it, really is what happens. I I start something new. I've all um, oftentimes I'm working on more than one kind of work at a time. Uh, for this show, I was really working sculpturally. I was really working on two groups of works. One were these organic pods that are really based on poppy seeds and or poppy uh, pod forms. And they became, uh, I started to abstract from those images and it became really a theme and variation. And I, uh, I really liked the group of them more than I liked them individually. As a matter of fact, when I saw just three of them there, uh, it, I didn't like it nearly as much as the studio shot where you could see a number of them working. I thought as a group, they start having Avery looks to them, maybe a bunch of chickens. They also look like flowers or a garden. And I like that part a lot. Uh, I, I teach drawing, I teach ceramics, I teach sculpture. And uh, I'm not trained as a potter. I've done really very little pottery in my life besides demonstrating for my students. I, uh, I had one ceramics class as an undergrad, and it was very pottery orientated, although I think had I stayed in that medium, I would have been able to expand out, but I didn't. I, I gravitated towards working with a designer, making sculpture and drawings. And so I got out of school, undergrad school, and the sculpture I was doing at that time, I was really wondering what the purpose was. I was alone again in a studio of my own, and I just began drawing. And the drawing had a sort of a funkiness to it. It was figurative, fantasy-like, surreal, a kind of a Midwestern surrealism. And it, I, but I really longed to get back into sculpture. I was set to go to graduate school and Lynn and I together were taking a workshop, a primitive fire workshop up at the UW Field Station in Northern Wisconsin. And I started building some work there. And I thought, this is the material I can get into to start get back to get back into sculpture. And so I really became a ceramic sculptor in graduate school, working figuratively and working, uh, then my drawings uh, made a transition into lithography. I got out of school and I got a teaching job right away. And I've taught at a two-year campus my whole career teaching some 35 years. And 
I, uh, so I, I have to be a generalist. I teach drawing, including life drawing and anatomy. I teach ceramics, as I said, and sculpture in all the mediums, steel, wood, plaster, modeling and casting, cold casting only. Uh, and so I, uh, it really dictates a lot of what I'm doing. Uh, I, the work I'm doing now with those pods and the portrait relief plates, I first made relief sculpture as a graduate student. And the relief kept coming out more and more three-dimensionally till they became forms that were no longer relief at all. They were from one vantage point. They worked like relief did. They were kind of stage sets. And I, uh, but I really stopped working in relief. I started throwing plates and uh, just as a demo. And I drew on one of the plates. And one day in my beginning drawing class, we were working with the figure and I grabbed some demo pots I had thrown and I drew on those and painted them with underglaze. And I got really excited about the possibility. Now I'd already began the pod forms and I thought that, oh, this could be really nice. And I'd like to investigate this. Now I chose for the plates, I chose composers. I love music, I play music, and I, uh, I play guitar and sitar, and I wanted to uh, start honoring uh, my, and it was a random number, it was really my 50 favorite composers. And all the compo my rules were for myself, were that I wanted to set up where they were, classical bass composers. I really like contemporary music. Uh, the, uh, the earliest plate is act the only one. Uh, there's two 19th century composers pictured there. I did do a Wagner uh, plate that I had no intention of uh, doing at first. And driving home from Minneapolis, uh, uh, a Wagner, synth, uh, Wagner opera was on public radio, live from the Met and uh, Valkyrie, and I was just so excited and I thought, oh, he's got to be part of the 50. And, but mostly it's 20th century or 21st century composers. Uh, new music, a lot of it uh, is, is uh, a combination of composers that are interested in rock and jazz and other forms, but they are trained classically. And that was my criteria that they had to have been trained as classical musicians if I was going to make a relief plate on them. Uh, it's really an extension of doing portraiture that I like to do a lot uh, when I teach life drawing and anatomy. I'm constantly drawing. I teach it like a workshop and I have my students working alongside me or I work alongside the students. And, uh, and even in the beginning drawing class, which is based in still life landscape and some other exercises, I do do some figuration in that class. And one of the things I love to do is to work on portraiture. So I chose uh, these portraits to build with the plates. Now both the pods and the plates were the first time I've really used thrown work for my own work. The pods are made out of different thrown shapes put together and the, uh, that I then hand worked. And the plates are, uh, it became, I didn't, uh, the turtle shells you saw, uh, one of them I believe uh, in the slides, that stuff was press molded in a, child's uh, flying saucer and uh, but for these plates I, it's really important to me that I throw the plates on the pottery wheel so I start and I make so I'm making pottery and uh, then I'm altering it uh, into a sculptural form and then painting the uh, the plates with colored slips 
Uh, I'm working with a red clay, so there's a red-brown base. I'm working with a white underglaze on top of that, which really looks like my Conti drawings, actually. But then I further embellish it with black and, uh, and then use glaze on certain areas to contrast the, the matte look of the underglazes when it's fired on. It really looks like tempera or a very matte acrylic paint. And, uh, and then juxtapose that with the glassy surface on the rims and the backs are glassy. And I'm just randomly choosing some quote that I've either read by the composer or something I look up uh, once. At first, I was, it was just things I was reading. And then I realized, oh, I can Google this. And I've got all these quotes from these composers and a whole host of them to, to lift. And, uh, and I'm really lifting all of it because I'm not working live from any of it. I, uh, I'm taking photographs that are on, on the computer. And, uh, and then uh, really, uh, I think what keeps it uh, for me from getting in trouble with it, well, first of all, no one sees it. And so I'm not getting, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but even if they did, I think I'm okay because I'm really not directly lifting the photograph. I'm just working with it. Uh, you know, in a sense, a lot of the composers I've chose are dead white guys. And uh, so, I, uh, anyway, that, that's kind of what I'm working on. The other slide that you saw uh, in my studio was a body of work I worked about five years on, and that was these landscape pieces. I've sort of done two bodies of landscape work in the last 35 years. I started by building these pieces into suspended drop ceilings that were when you look uh, when you looked up it's sort of like you were looking underground and uh, and they ran their course and I didn't know I would go back to landscape at all in sculpture and uh, one of the things you get in ceramics is you get leftover clay buckets sitting around and I had my students doing a theme and variation on plates make plates and do theme and variation on there well I saw these dried clay forms in these slurry buckets and I just loved them and I fired them and then I started to paint them and they really morphed into something else quickly. I'd also add little embellishments so I'd play with scale. So it'd give an indication of what size I'm imagining the thing at rather than the size being somewhat ambiguous. Uh, I think I'm done. Did you want me to show any of, the, <laughs> any of those sure. images again, Frank? Sure. Oh, yeah, show them all. Yeah, yeah. You right. show the studio shot especially with yeah. the landscapes, and then uh, yeah, excellent. Then let and me pull that up again. Um, let's see. Yeah, so these are those three pod forms you were talking about. The it's like poppy shapes. Yeah. 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 And then they're salt fired, uh, which is really a technique that one of my major professors made the renaissance of uh, in, in the States, really, Don Wright. And I, I built this salt kiln at UW Fox and uh, to do that. On the left is a turtle shell. Uh, again, uh, a whole body of that work. They were abstractions. This is obviously the inside of the turtle shell. I like bones and stuff. Uh, first job I ever had in undergraduate school was I worked for the Allied Health Department and the first set of drawings I had to do for them was rat control and housing. So the rats sort of become a humorous symbol for me. And this is uh, done about 20 years ago, actually. It's in our backyard. It's in bronze. I had a sabbatical to Nepal and I did bronze casting and series of pastel works there. And then show that studio shot, if you would. Yeah, that's this one. Right? Are we, 
Yeah, there. Yeah. So you can see the pods on the on the right, uh, a few more of them, how they work, the different sizes. In the way back, you can see uh, uh, turtle shells, uh, uh, all uh, the insides of them. The back side looks like the outside of a shell or it's uh, taken from that. Uh, and then, but the landscape work, the larger pieces are on the floor. Now they were, um, uh, they're really, they are slurry that were made in a child's swimming pool. The first one uh, that's closest to us was an accident. Uh, the smaller, it's on shelves, you really can't see them on the left below that, a wall piece. But those are uh, the, the size of the slurry bucket landscapes. The large pieces uh, were, uh, what I was doing, I was cleaning up the studio at school and I threw all this dried clay outside in a child's swimming pool and I thought, oh, I'd let it slake down and uh, just remix it. And all of a sudden it was started to dry in the summer and I had a weed growing out of it and I really liked it. And I thought, I'm going to fire this. And uh, so it's real thick but I just fire it for extended periods of time, a couple of days, and uh, to get it to work. And I liked it so much that I actually decided to make a triptych of, uh, of those three floor pieces. And they're really different times. Uh, you can't see it in here, but the one in the front is about war. All sorts of little figures are in it, uh, fighting with each other. Uh, there's a pyramid structure in the farthest one back, and then kind of a modernist, uh, futuristic sculpture on the one that's on the right. Mm -hmm. And then they're painted with acrylic uh, to embellish the, the clay colors themselves. Uh, it's Steve Reich and uh, Schoen uh, Schoenberg there. I love Steve Reich's music. And I like I uh, love twelve tone music as well uh, of Schoenberg's and and Berg's, and then I think the other two plates are uh, Eric Satie, uh, who's uh, his piano pieces. I, there's nothing like them for their era, the beginning of the 20th century, and uh, I, I just think it's fantastic music. And then John Cage, uh, I, when I first heard, I was, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe uh, 20 years old, and I first heard the prepared pianos. And uh, I realized uh, from this album that I bought, uh, how the piano was prepared with nuts and bolts in there. And he did it because at first he was trying to make a percussion instrument out of it, like a, a Japanese gamelan sounding instrument. And it was for performing with Mears Cunningham's dance troupe. And he just tried putting plates in the inside of it while they bounce around. And he, when he came to the idea that he could put nuts and bolts in different things in between the strings and made this incredible percussion instrument out of it. I was totally fascinated. Uh, the quotes on the back, uh, you can see Satie's, uh, what he's talking about. John Cage, of course, he's known for four minutes and 33 seconds of silence and three movements. And so just tongue in cheek wise, I gave him three lines with no, uh, with no voice coming out. Beautiful work. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Frank. Thank you. So I'm going to stop that. Lynn, you're in the hot seat. <laughs> well, I would like to thank you for the magazine oh. and trying to uh, engage uh, dialogue among creatives in the Fox Cities and perhaps broaden the audience for the arts. I think that there's a better environment for a variety of art mediums in 
the valley since we moved here in the late 80s and i appreciate that growing audience and then uh, your effort to enlarge it as well so i've always loved art uh, drawing from the time i was a very small child i got a lot of very positive feedback for so even uh, before i was in school people could recognize the images and they seemed excited about them and i think there is a real excitement <laughs> when you can create something that gets a reaction from an audience but also on a very personal level uh, just uh, appreciating that you can be a creator a as i've aged that element of it has really grown so i think we're in this really mad consumerist society and it's always like more 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 and people are more consumers than they are creatives i think in an earlier time uh women because i love textiles uh, i have some history books of the history of textiles in america and they talk about how every woman would weave uh, and spin and create the textiles for their family uh, people did a lot more work themselves so when i began teaching i'm a high school art teacher i taught uh, K-12, I've taught art methods at Lawrence. I've been at Xavier High School for 27 years. I was at Tisa's at the two grade schools in the cities before that. I taught K-12 at Reedsville Public Schools. I taught Marshfield Columbus High School. We've moved around a little bit. Um, but uh, I had students who would come to me who had used a hammer and different uh, tools at home. and. In recent years, that's not been the case, right? So I appreciate my ability to make more and more in this kind of over the top consumerist society. I started to sew when I was nine years old. My mother thought it would be a good idea. She signed me up for 4-H. My very first uh, sewing project was an apron. But I had uh, grandmothers who were wonderful makers as well. I had a grandmother who taught me how to make curtains. My other grandmother ta taught me how to make lampshades. And I, I just always loved the making part of it. When my father brought me up to the university to go to school, he drove me up to Eau Claire from the Milwaukee area. And uh, he said to me uh, that I didn't have to do this to please him. He wasn't paying for it, first of all. <laughs> uh, but he, you know, he said to do what I wanted to do, to do it for me. And I didn't know what I was going to study. But my very first semester, I took a Egyptian art history class and I just fell in love. And this is what I had been interested in as a child all the way through my um, you know, my K-12 years. And I just thought, okay, I'm gonna go for it. Uh, never thinking about a job. <laughs> and my undergrad degree, my first degree was in studio arts and art history uh, because I just took what I wanted to take. I wasn't thinking about trying to uh, make a living from, from the work. I met Frank in undergraduate school I think we met in an art history since 1950 class. Uh, really appreciated him as a maker. Uh, his work was very different than mine. I tend to sort of like a, a faux naive look or I'm fascinated by outsider art and folk artists, just this compulsion to make without having to have had this sort of strenuous academic background that really uh, moves and motivates me that there's some kind of popular impulse to create. And Frank always liked uh, modernism, uh, 
you know, even beginning with what I had thought was kind of a yawn or a snore, this Russian constructivist work, and he really helped me to appreciate it. And uh, <laughs> uh, that was a, a real gift to, to me to, instead of disregard something as boring, that he, by talking about it, he would open it up for me and help me to appreciate it. So we've always been an audience for each other. And I think that that's been a real gift, but also maybe it has made us sort of complacent, like we didn't have to push ourselves for a greater audience because we, you know, we had each other in this sort of making adventure over all of these years. So, you know, I said that I started to sew um, as a child. And when I was in college, I had a professor who told me that the very best art was personal, but touched the universal. So I thought, okay, what's personal? And I thought this, this making of uh, things with fabric. I also, it was a time uh, in the early 70s where feminism was becoming more popular. I mean, it had started earlier, but uh, with this sort of whole social upheaval that happened in the 60s um, and into the 70s, uh, it was certainly more uh, in the public view so that a small town, rural Wisconsin girl uh, was very aware of feminism. So certainly I had friends who thought, okay, I'm gonna weld sculptures and you know, I can do whatever I wanna do. Women shouldn't be limited. And I just thought I wanted to celebrate what women had done through the centuries. And they had had this connection with textiles and I wasn't gonna throw the baby out with the bathwater. I was going to embrace this kind of work. Uh, so, you know, I showed an older, older quilt. Uh, I do make narrative quilted wall work. Uh, I have for, for many years. Uh, the hats are a newer series that have happened over a three year period. I worked making one a month for 12 months and that had originally been my goal. And then I stopped for a year and I started it up again. Uh, I like the hats. A lot of the quilts would take me a thousand hours. Uh, the one that you saw that I uh, shared a picture of is entirely hand sewn. There's no machine work with it at all. And uh, the hats are all hand sewn. I don't use a sewing machine with them. So I, I like, um, these take 120 hours. It's still a long time and uh, some maybe not quite so much. I think one only took me 80 hours and the one that took the longest was like 120 hours. But I really like that kind of slowness to the making of my textile work. Uh, again, it's kind of like I, um, I'm slowing things down so it isn't this kind of rat race thing that I was talking a little bit about earlier with my pride in being a maker and not just a consumer. So instead of producing, you know, tons, this way I get to produce a smaller amount of things. Uh, the puppets, I have loved puppets since I was a child. So they used to have a marionette troupe that came every year to Heartland, this little town where I grew up. And it was 50 cents and you could sit on the floor in the gym and, uh, and you know, watch them once a year, uh, recreate some fairy tale that you already knew. But it was very magic for me. And in the late 90s, I realized there was a group of puppeteers, mostly out of the UW Oshkosh theater department, who were members of a Wisconsin puppetry guild. And I uh, just joined and started going to festivals, international puppetry festivals, the Puppeteers of America Festival. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna teach puppets. How fun is this? 
I mean, art, I always tell my students, art is our work, but it, it's also, there's an element of play in it. Like I don't plan my stuff out. I, I have an idea and I start to work and it's really, I tell my students, a conversation between the materials, the process, um, and, and uh, you know, and myself. So it's a, it's a very organic kind of, of process. And I, I think that it's an adult at play, even though I'm putting in the hours, I'm putting in the work. Uh, there's a large dog cage sitting outside in our garden area that I want to uh, peyote bead stitch, and it'll take a couple hundred hours. And for me, it's a cage, so it's kind of like doing time, like being in prison, or again, it's this, you know, whole kind of slow down thing, but it's also play for me. So it's work and it's, and it's play. Um, so I started to teach the puppetry at Xavier, and I started to do the giant parade puppets as well as the hand puppets. So I did that for years, and it was really... Uh, something I just demonstrated, but then it, you know, it blossomed into hundreds of hand puppets and probably a hundred parade puppets over the 20 years that I put them on the street for the uh, downtown Appleton Holiday Parade. I haven't done it for the last three years and it's kind of a relief. Uh, just finding uh, uh, 60 to 100 people to bring them to life on the street was a task that I didn't really enjoy. Um, and uh, the commitment from people who wanted to put heavy things on their body and be out in extreme cold, uh, you know, sometimes they'd say they were going to do it and they'd get there and they didn't want to do it. And uh, even though it was joyful for me, it had kind of run its course. But over the last few years, I've made a couple just for myself. Uh, last year, I made um, a giant lurch puppet. And this year, after the fact, after the Day of the Dead, I made the giant uh, skull ride. <laughs> because I uh, had been just so inspired by all of the images on the internet. So I thought, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make one because I, I do love the process. And it's the exact same process that I use to make the small hand puppets that I do to make the big ones. And I like to work in front of my students so they can see the work happening. Uh, there was um, a drawing that I did. Uh, just because I wanted to show that drawing is a big part of my process. It's what got me interested in art as a child in the, in the first place. Um, what else did I have an image of? Uh, the hats. Uh, I, after the year break, I went back to it and I made another hat a month for a year. So there are 24. I'm giving it a little break, but I'm not done with that. Uh, there will be more hats in the future. Um, in the show, there was also going to be a dozen dolls that I've made recently. That's something that I taught uh, to one of my classes over the last 10 years, and I enjoy making those. Um, how are we doing for time? I think, I think we're good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you want me to- We could take questions. Did you want me to pull up any of your images at all, Lynn, and go through them again? You can run through them again, sure. Okay, sure. Which means I need to remember how to do this again. <laughs> so when did you do these, Lynn? Um, I did those this fall. And uh, Part of the inspiration for it was in 2016, I went to the Women's March in Madison, and it was a really joyful experience for me getting together with all of these women. I made many of the pink pussy hats. Um, I gave them to friends. I sent four to DC for the big Women's March. Uh, and 
I, you know, I, I kind of wanted to bring back the energy that I felt at the Women's March thinking about this upcoming election cycle. And this isn't quite over because uh, on the 7th of April, when we were supposed to vote, you know, I think a lot of people didn't go vote because of the stay at home order and the coronavirus. And uh, a lot of people applied for ballots, uh, absentee ballots, our daughter did, and hers didn't come in time. Uh, she applied before the deadline and it didn't arrive until after the election. So I'm gonna be making uh, a plague doctor puppet and uh, he'll be facing these women. <laughs> so this, isn't, this piece isn't quite done. And I had talked about this. So. The larger Day of the Dead piece. And... Right, so I made this in December. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this hat, uh, I made this fall. Uh, the young woman modeling it is a former student who's uh, in Waukesha going to college now. And she came back. She does a lot of modeling professionally. And I just said, hey, you want to model my hats? the two that I just finished, and she said, sure. So there's just a six of the 24 hats. Yeah. I like how you have a mix of cultural, I mean, there's a football, so cultural items that we would immediately recognize and then you know, it seems like you, you work with a lot of different cultures with your work. And I like that you mix um, American pop culture with other worldly ideas. Thank you. Is that something you've always done? Well, it's that interest in folk art. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's a, it is a kind of uh, homage to this creative impulse across cultures. Mm -hmm. um, this piece was just finished recently. There's a Midwest Bead Society uh, call for owl uh, pins and uh, the pieces are due for the jury uh, May 18th. And they had to be owl themed jewelry. So one of the hats, here I'll grab it. <laughs> I called this um, night watch. So it's these different animals looking up at the, the sky. Oh, yeah. And um, so this was gonna be Night Watch 2. Mm -hmm. And I'd already had the idea that I was going to, to make this as a flat piece. Kind of, you know, it's the same sort of trees and, uh, and then I was going to have it as a presentation environment for the owl pin. So the owl comes off uh, and uh, I was, one of my muses was old English 3D embroidery. Usually it was done with gold thread, but I would see these in museums like the National Gallery or the Met in New York City. And, uh, you know, they look like they, like women spent a year making them. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, felt kind of confined by the small size that of a pin or something. And, uh, wanted to make this presentation environment for the pin. So kind of combined the two ideas, uh, making this piece for this juried exhibition um, with their theme. Everything had to be owl themed. Right. So this was the drawing. Um, painting. I mean, I used watercolor in the background, but just playing with some Sumi ink 
uh, marbling and drawing on top. I mean, I looked at the marbling and I saw skull and maybe nobody else would have, but I you know, brought it out. Um, So this is the older quilt. Um, then it's a drawing I did of Frank with some printmaking. In the background, I did a lin linoleum carving of a rat. And, uh, you know, Frank talked about how he's done some rat images over the years. Uh, I also have done it sort of riffing on, on his uh, kind of personal iconic symbol um something we share great all right um so kat and i had a katarina had a couple of questions that we wanted to ask and if anyone wants to ask any questions just go ahead and type it in the chat program or the chat portion of this program um, and Katarina will um, unmute you in a little bit and you can ask um, Lynn and Frank directly what you might want to know. Um, yeah, there you go. Put that hat on, Lynn. So I had a question that kind of, the two of you somewhat answered it. And this is a question for both of you, I guess, but when you're starting a new project, um, do you talk to each other? Do you confer with each other of what you're going to do before you start it, you know, in the, as, it's, as it's starting to beginning? And um, when you finish your work then, do you see it as the work of an individual or do you see it as a more collaborative process because of maybe any kind of conversations that you started out with? Just because the two of you are so closely together, you're working, you're living together. I mean, I, what, how much of that affects you, each other? Um, I, I don't know that we discuss specifically when we begin a new piece. We might say to each other, oh, I'm really excited about this thing that I've started. And mm -hmm. Would you come look at it? <laughs> uh, and we do give each other some critique, but I think we definitely look at our work as individual work. Um, we have collaborated a, a couple of times, but generally it's individual work. Yeah. yeah. Um, Frank, do you think that as artists, do we have a responsibility to share our work with the world? Yeah, I think so. Uh, otherwise, I, I mean, from my own perspective, yes. I think otherwise, why am I doing it really? Sure, I'm doing it for myself because it gives me kicks and I, like, I just like to make stuff and I like to see where it'll all evolve. But I think really uh, to complete the artwork, it needs to be put out there so a connection is made uh, with the audience. I think the audience sees things in the work, either good or bad, that neither of us see because uh, we're too close to it, especially uh, individually with our own work. I mean, uh, I'm working on it and after a while, I don't even see really, I have trouble being objective in my own work. I'm too close to it really. And I think, uh, so the audience, the general audience uh, provides that really. Uh, I don't know um, that I'm communicating anything to them other than aesthetics but uh, they certainly are communicating to me. So I read uh, Pat's question. The uh, style of hat is a Glengarry hat. 
And, you know, they all 24 hats were the same. And uh, we have a, a daughter who's an artist who's in her late 20s. And she says, Mom, why don't you use a different uh, style of hat? You know, you could make anything you want. Why do you keep using this same hat? And uh, for me, it's a blank canvas. I actually really like this very simple form of the Glengarry. To me, it kind of disappears and then it just becomes about the handwork that I'm embellishing. So my grandfather came from Scotland when he was three uh, in the late 1800s. And I, I you know, I, so I feel a connection to this sort of, you know, Scottish military hat pattern or something. And uh, the beadwork, uh, it started out being about this kind of raised Iroquois beadwork. So the Scottish soldiers helped the English in the Revolutionary War, and they left behind some of these hats. And the East Coast uh, First Nations people really liked the Scottish regalia and the bagpipes. And so uh, they started to make this pattern in velvet and embellish it with raised beadwork. At the turn of the century, Niagara Falls was a big tourist destination, and the number one souvenir to bring back from a visit to Niagara Falls was raised Iroquois beadwork. So I was teaching myself different techniques uh, from YouTube videos. I think I watched three of them, and then I got bored with it, and I just started to make up my own 3D forms with beads. You know, I'd learned enough from watching 20 minutes of how-to videos that I could really fly with it. And um, so, uh, but then I, you know, I got into a well, okay, I want to work with feathers. And uh, I ran into Pat Huss displaying maybe six of these hats uh, down at the Foxleys for a uh, Northeast Wisconsin Art Association event. And she said, oh, my mom used to make hats out of feathers and you dip the end in rubber cement. And I thought, oh, you know, you cut off the little furry ends. And I thought, I can totally do this. And, um, you know, I started to combine applique work. And uh, here's one that has, uh, you know, a sculptural element on the top. And, you know, I started to um, have like 3D things that came off and started to use netting and, you know, different kind of handmade laces and, you know, just having fun with it. But uh, where it began was this sort of heritage thing. Um, I made Frank um, a skunk hat when we were in college. He told me one day I'd really like a skunk hat. So I threw a plastic bag in my trunk and the first uh, roadkill I found, I picked it up and I skinned it and tanned it. So that actually is my fifth skunk hat. So actually I've been making hats for a longer time. Um, they weren't all Glengarry's. These were the first Glengarry's I made, but it just, that's where it began. Katarina, did you have any questions you wanted to? Well, that was one of my major questions was kind of the history of the hats because I've been following you on social media and watching your process of making these hats. And I, I uh, am really intrigued by the materials that you use because, uh, for example, the animal pelts that you find are just, it's not something that I would necessarily think that would adorn a hat, but it really like pulls a fantasy element to it, which I think is really cool. Um, so I was going to ask you, Frank, because you talked about selecting class uh composers that were classically trained and then you kind of talked about throwing them on this like classic shape of the plate um how important is it as an artist to have a classic foundation of technique 
because I feel like we can go a lot of different places with that. A lot of people have um, their own process of getting to where they are and other people really hide, I don't want to say hide, but stick inside a technique and like hone in on it. Uh oh. Oh no, I think we lost Frank and Lynn. Yeah. And I think he doesn't know that we lost them. No. Oh no. Um, shoot. Well, well, Katarina's, is Frank muted? Um, it doesn't say that they're muted. Oh, shoot. I think we lost the two of them again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's one way to end the meeting. <laughs> yeah. um, Nicole Zimmerman made a comment saying, you both made an impression on me during my high school years. I had wonderful memories from art class, New Visions Gallery or to, to, to uh, New York City. Um, I also got to go to New York City with Frank. And when I went to school at UW Fox, and it was really nice to be able to go and see all the haunts that he would take the kids to. Um, it's great having both Lynn and Frank being such important instructors and creators in our community. And I'm really happy that they continue to work. One of the questions I was gonna ask them is, is um, how would you like to be remembered? And um, I can oh. only imagine, oh, now I think they're completely gone. I think they're coming back in. Okay. Well, then I'm gonna ask them that directly. <laughs> oh, no. Yes, here we go. All right. Are you there? We're here. Oh, Can you yeah. hear us? oh my goodness. We lost you for a bit. We lost you right when I asked the question. It just like poof disappeared. <laughs> All right. Well, I can answer. Yeah. Uh, it's really a, a classical background is really important to me. I, I think I need it. Uh, it, it frees me up to, uh, and perhaps one of the problems in my work is that it's uh, somewhat like a chameleon. And I, but also Stravinsky did the same thing, right? He started getting popular with the great uh, triptych of ballets, Petrushka, Rite of Spring, and uh, the Firebird Suite, but then became a neoclassicist. And he called style uh, that he didn't believe in one artistic style. Style was something that he took, uh, uh, that he just started to be involved with. And so the more things that I know, the more chops, uh, using a, a guitar player's term or whatever I have, the more it frees me up to be able to try new things. You know, it's certainly not the only way for other artists. I mean, uh, some artists do the same thing their whole life and they're tra self-trained and, uh, you know, they do fantastic work. But uh, for me, uh, it, I think it, I need it. Uh, and some of that's that I come from a quite provincial kind of background. Well, I think that uh, as a teacher and thinking about teaching art, there are uh, some schools that really push the conceptual end. And for both of us, we think the conceptual end is really important, but we think if you have some skill sets and you can teach skill sets, then you have more options uh, of places to take the conceptual. So I think a classical training, and I think Frank would agree, is a fine thing. Oh. Uh -huh. Nicole said she wanted to share a picture of a quilt that you did, Lynn, and that you had a great story about it. 
I'm going to unmute you, Nicole, one sec. There you go, Nicole. Hey, guys. Nice to see you. It's been ages. Okay, I don't know if this, I'm going to try a screen share. Let me see. Oh, I don't think I can do it uh, unless the host enables yeah. it and i'm trying to see and i'm trying to think if there's another way i can do it oh i might i might have a cheat maybe let me see let me see. i don't know if this will work i'm going to try putting my camera You might not be able to. Oh, just hold that there for a second. Yeah, Lynn, you remember this from Columbus High School? Your Madonna? This was the one I believe that you um, had sent away to a show and it got lost. And some period later, you found that a priest had bought it at auction in another state. Do you remember this? And then somehow it got connected back with you. Um, oh, do we have audio? I, do we have audio issues again, Lynn? And yeah, I think yeah. so. Oh, oh no. dang it. <laughs> it's gonna leave us hanging again it is it was it's a fantastic story though and yeah. um what i remember or, or the extra funny thing for me was um i was working at a library this was probably oh 10 years ago and she had, she probably made that quilt about what 30 years ago maybe and um, I, I, you know, a lot of times libraries get book donations and I happened to just uh, pick up this book, open it to a page and here was Lynn's quilt that I remembered from my high school years hanging right outside her classroom. And I was like, well, this is crazy. But in the, um, description it didn't attribute it to her and i was like wait a minute this is insane and then um i i think i posted it on facebook and then um lynn was able to to continue and share the story about how it had gotten lost um and then was found <laughs> and it was just it's a kind of an amazing story but i believe I believe the church or the rectory or somebody of the, you know, still has it, but, but it, 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 uh, it made an impact on me because I can remember passing that, you know, every day, probably for what, six months or something um, in, in, uh, I don't know what year of high school it would have been, but um, yeah, it was, a uh, it was something that I had not I had not experienced that kind of art before I, that might sound kind of generic to say um but up until that point you know um I certainly had never uh seen you know a wall hanging of such you know and and you can't tell from the photo but it's also 3d the Madonna is very fully 3d so I still love it <laughs> I still love it well, thank you for sharing that, Nicole, and the story. That's that's pretty fantastic. So, back in again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did we lose them again? They're probably trying back one more time. Yeah. Well, hopefully, our guests come back here. Here they come. Lynn and Frank? Yeah. Yeah, we couldn't hear anything. Oh, no. Well, 
if anything, and um, we will have this, it's recorded, so we'll have it on YouTube and on our FSM um, Facebook page and the new website that Kat and I are, are working on right now will also have links to it. Um, and then you can hear everything that you missed about that quilt. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Well, Nikki was a high school student of mine uh, at Marshfield Columbus when I made that. Wonderful. So, yeah. yeah. Or at, yeah, when it was found, were you, it got lost and uh, found. Yeah, she probably told the whole story. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I we really appreciate having been able to spend this time with you, and this is fantastic. And, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And um, please watch every week. We'll have another two guests on, community guests, um, to talk about the arts and why is it important to, to have people creating and people sharing and people just loving what they do and willing to put it out there. And so thank you, Frank. Thank you. Lynn, um, thank you, Katarina, for helping me put this together. And we'll see you all next week, I hope. All right. Take care. See ya. Bye.